welcome everyone. Thank you very much for coming to this session. My name is Anna and I'm a producer, an engineer since 2014. I'm an Ableton certified trainer, a native instruments product specialist and also an educator. I work in Point Blank Music School, um, which is a really cool place. We've got campuses all around the world teaching degree courses. And what I'm going to deliver today is actually going to be a quite hot topic across all the degrees um, in the school. I'm also a content creator. You might have seen me on YouTube. I've done videos, tutorials uh, for Ableton, Adam Audio, Native Instruments. I've been writing an Ableton Left column for Future Music. And I recently also wrote a book about Ableton Live because... I really love Ableton Live, just like teaching about it. So today, what we're going to be doing? I will do my best to guide you through all of this. This is quite a lot of stuff. So we're going to look at a basic home setup to start recording vocals. And microphone selections, microphone placements, room acoustics, setting the mood to enhance performance quality, recording workflows, editing workflows, and hopefully effect processing. So the first part of this masterclass will be a little bit more theoretical because basically your vocals will sound as good as the recording is. So it is fairly important that we know about all the first kind of topics. Now, I do have some questions though. Who is producing music? from the audience already. Amazing. Who likes to use vocals? Who is recording vocals? Okay, who prefers samples? Less and less, okay, amazing. So I think this is a very important topic because um, getting vocal hooks, I think is really accessible. There are loads of sample packs, you know, subscription-based. Um, places where we can get hold of royalty-free um, hooks and loops and um, they tend to sound really good because they are already processed, they are already balanced. So you put them into um, your DAW and it already sounds great and very inspiring. And then you get like a raw recording and obviously it's not processed. It's not, you know, jailing into the track straight away so much. Um, so it can be sometimes of putting so some people therefore prefer to stick to samples but because it's accessible anybody can have the same sample so you know knowing how to get good vocal takes and recordings is gonna open up doors to record yourself hopefully you will sing as well um, and to work with people which is super important collaboration to make music and and have fun so the first thing we're going to look at is a basic home setup because we're not going to be talking about expensive studios today and expensive gear and, you know, I could, I love talking about gear and, you know, geeking out, but it is all about accessibility because I think today is music production in general is more accessible than ever. So all you need basically is a computer, a decent interface, a decent microphone, and a decent pair of headphones, and you're ready to go. Now, microphone selections, though. So, I mean, since most of you already are recording, you might already know some of this, but the three main kind of groups we have is condenser microphones, um, ribbon microphones, and um, dynamic microphones. So today, we are going to be focusing more on dynamic and condensers, because that's what you will see most um, around. Of course, in big studios, there are really nice and expensive ribbon microphones as well. So dynamic mics, we've seen this everywhere. Stages, studios, it's a really good quality mic, the Shure SM58. SM and what kind of makes a difference between dynamic mics and condenser ones is the dynamic microphones can take um, high sound pressure level, which is why you see it most of the time on stage, because there is noise, there is audience, there is you know music playing, monitoring. 
So it, is, it can handle all of that. Also, it's a bit more robust. Like, I don't know if you guys have seen these microphones that are not really shaped into a ball anymore, but like kind of looking really funny because they were dropped many times. And they still work because that's what they are designed for. Fairly cheap as well, but it does give you a less detailed recording. Now, condenser microphones though. So this is what we would see in studios, not on stage, because it cannot take high sound pressure level um, unless it's got a pad, but there would be feedback and probably the mic would kind of not survive either. But it is used in controlled studio environment because it's very um, sensitive. So it will give you a very nice and detailed um, recording. Of course, it's pricier as well. There is a really big range of price that we could name to get a condenser microphone going from like 100 pounds up until 12,000. It also needs extra power, which is this 48 volt button on an audio interface called phantom power. Dynamic microphones don't need that. Something really important though, with condenser mics that they can come with different polar patterns, which means is if you look at the mic, from which direction is going to be picking up the sound from. And there are multiple reasons for that. So the three main, there's more of them, there's hypercordioid, there's, there's quite a few more polar patterns, but these are the three main types. So if it's a cardioid, that's probably the most popular and widely used um, to record vocals with. Um, so what it means is that it picks up the sound in this kind of heart shape from the, the front of the microphone. So what it means, it's super important that you know which is the front of the microphone because if you don't get that right, because some mics can, you know, maybe they don't have the labels and anything on it anymore, a bit more older. Um, it's going to sound very muffled because it's not supposed to pick up sound from the back side of the microphone. And then there are figure eights, which is kind of um, not the opposite, but it is designed to pick up sound from the front and the back of the microphone as well. And it's good for duets and also not so much for, um, for vocals, but for many other recording techniques with other instruments, there's like good purpose for them. And there's the omnidirectional mics, which is microphone and it's picking up sound from everywhere. So it's not very like focused. So cardioid is good for vocals um, because it's really focused on the face, on the mouth, and it's not picking up sound from around. So there's less noise. And then some mics, of course, the more pricier ones, they have switchable poro patterns, so they can work in any of these ways. Now, my amazing images, I couldn't wait to use them today. So what shouldn't you do with microphones? Because it affects a lot. So, you know, if we look at video clips, if we look at, you know, movies, um, whatever, and we see people like holding down the mic like proper at the cap. Um, it's actually not good because it affects the frequency response and what the microphone is picking up. So these are the no's, like don't hold the cap off the mic because then it will kind of give a big boost around um, the mids and it rolls off the highs, so it's just gonna sound muffled. Also, don't hold it close, very, very close to the mouth. Um, not just for uh, hygiene reasons, but um, because it will cause, for example, proximity effect, which we're gonna talk about in a bit. Microphones got a handle for a reason, so just grab it by the handle, and then we have a way flatter um, frequency response that we can pick up. Also, a decent amount of distance between the mouth and the microphone. So these are the yeses. Now, the condenser mics. That is also very important. How far to be from the microphone, really, to get a decent recording. Once again, we're going to test this. I'll have um, some audio um, where I talk in different distances. If you're too close, again, it's going to cause proximity effects. If you're too far, it's going to be too much noise. So that's like a good technique to measure, like the mic between 
the mic, the distance between the mic and your mouth, either with the two fists or like this. And then it's good to shove in a pop shield in the middle as well for the plosives, which we will also hear in a second. Now, I talked about acoustics as well, because we are still talking about home recordings. So it is important, especially if we work with condenser microphones, that its control environment is quiet because it's sensitive, it picks up everything. Even if you've got a closed door, your neighbor runs across the hall, you're going to get that like low end picked up by the mic. So it is you know, good to have a quiet place to start with. And also your room. What shape is your room? Is it a tall room? Is it a box room? How much stuff you have? You got windows, you got mirrors. It's all gonna affect the recording. Sometimes it is not possible to get your room acoustically treated. Um, it's fairly cheap to get some foam, but we know about landlords, so you can't always stick it up on the wall. So therefore, if you can't do that, then can you use one of these, which helps a little bit to isolate um, and get rid of reflections and reverb um, in the room. If you never really thought about it or also like kind of where to stand in your room, um, go home and start clapping around your room and you will actually notice that if you clap a bit closer where your curtain is and your couch is, there's going to be less reflection and reverb. But if you go to a place that's a bit more empty, then you will start hearing um, echo and that's definitely not a good place to be recording. So, yeah, these are fairly cheap. You can get them from Amazon. Makes loads of difference. To me, this is really important, like setting the mood um, and getting yourself or an artist comfortable because vocals, like to me, when there are vocals on a track, is is the main character. You know, like the track is is around it, but the vocals will tell the story. It's going to give the emotions. If it's a love song, it needs to have that passion coming out. If it's I don't know, more like a happy song, it also has to have that vibe. But it would be sung differently. Now. Trying to get an artist to sing a very passionate R&B love song while they are shoved into a cold room um, where maybe they are actually a bit freezing, they've got no water, it's, you know, grey and just there, they're not really going to perform very well. So it's actually fairly nice to set up a nice mood to help those emotions to, to come out in the recording because words can be sung, you know, many times, but they're not necessarily going to be sounding the same way, which is the beauty of recording vocals. So some pointers, you know, getting some lighting. I love candles. Don't recommend them, though, for safety purposes. But, you know, <laughs> a little bit of lead light, fairy light, something. Get some water. If you're recording someone or yourself, do you want to sit? Do you want to stand? How the lyrics is going to be read? You know, phone, iPad, stand, paper. If it's paper, where are you going to stick it on the wall? Or, you know, these are like small things to think about, but super important. Also developing soft skills. That's something that I say to my students in Point Blank that it's super important to start doing it as early as possible for many reasons because again especially with vocalists because you need the people to give the emotions out so you know soft skills are super super important to be able to make people feel themselves comfortable so they want to come back they want to work with you they feel you know they feel good get the mood right and get the best performance a little geekier bit the proximity effect that I've been um, talking about and also she's a big enemy and another big enemy is getting the gain right, which what I see can be hard for beginners to kind of crack the how to set the gain for what, when, in the software, in on the interface and what difference it makes and because it will make a difference in post-production as well. So first proximity effect. Closer we are to the microphone, the more the plosives, the P's, the B's, the, all of those sounds are going to come out very strong. 
and they are very pleasant, unpleasant, and they actually can distort as well. I'll show you um, an example. But then we have this problem if we go too far away, then we pick up too much noise. So what do we do? And then the gain, which is to do with that as well, how far from the microphone and how do we set the the gain up, what is too much, what is too little, how do we sound check, how do we get the artist, what part of the performance do we get them to sing to get the right level. So I will come back to that, but we're going to have a little listen of these examples of just recordings. So I use the same microphone, and if we look at the waveform, we already can see like big, big differences in it. So the first one will be where I didn't use the pop shield and I was really close to the microphone. I'm just talking, so don't, don't get scared. There'll be nothing, uh, not singing yet. Let's listen to some proximity effect. All the bottom end is very, the B's and the P's are distorting and not very pleasant. Yeah, so we get that those sounds came out and you know, I didn't really do anything. I've just literally, I was just really close to the microphone and you can hear I'm not really talking even that loud, but it does pick it up. The second one, I've maintained my distance, as we learned today, from the microphone and I put a pop shield between us as well. So then that sounded like this. Now I'm um, a proper um, distance from the microphone and I'm using a pop shield so hopefully we can hear the different that the bottom end is not that bad yeah way better yeah still a little bit but way better the next one look at the waveform so that's caused back down to to this here the gain so in music production red is bad that's just the bottom end of it. Nothing should be read either in the, in the interface or in the software either. So you heard me talking. I had a really nice healthy level of gain set. And then I decided to change that and really push it to the red, which was too much. And then that sounded like this. See what it sounds like when I've got way too much gain and everything is pretty much red in live as well. Uh, it's distortion. What's really wrong with it that you can't really fix it because the waveform got chopped off. Um, so there's nothing much to really do. This recording is, I don't even think the sound restoration software from Isotope could save this. And then the next one is when it's the opposite. When there is not enough gain at all, same distance, but just very little amount of gain. Now let's see what it sounds like if I'm fairly far away from the microphone and also... I'm going to put the gain up from the clip. Um, it can clearly be visible from the meter as well as I haven't set the gain. So the problem with this, because the waveform is so small, that's supposed to be silent there, but we can kind of see the levels because that's noise. So that's gonna come up with the um, audio as well. So these are like kind of the extremes of how much it matters, how far we are from the microphone and how we set up the gain. Super important tip. If we're recording, let's say a nice um, little song with words, with chorus, etc. If you're not recording yourself, how do you set the gain to the perfect level? You always ask the singer to sing the loudest part of the song. Like make sure that they don't push it too much, but always sound check with the loudest, you know, part of the vocal take. Because if you do you know, with the nice little intimate verse, and then you set the levels for that, and then the chorus comes in and everything is going to be red again, so you have to start again. So it's a good practice to, to sound check with the loud bit. Another thing that can be done with proximity effect is if we tilt the microphone a little bit, so that's something that you can always play with because it will change the characteristic of the voice, though it might sound a bit more nasal or a bit brighter. Um, but if it's like a deeper voice, then there is still too much bass coming, then we can maybe tilt the mic a little from the top. 
to the bottom, and then we pick up a bit more, um, a bit brighter sound. So it's worth changing, you know, while you're trying to record someone, see how the singer sounds the best, basically. That's it about the theory. Well done, all survived. We're gonna move on to the practical bits. So recording workflows, super, super important. Um, using take lanes to get the best kind of performance. To record multiple takes of the same line and then comp the best bits together. So I've got a little video um, while I already recorded some takes. So the first thing I'm going to do is loop up the section where I'm intended to sing and then we can right click, control click and choose show take lane and we're ready to go. I came here for justice. Oh. You reminded me I had a home because it's breaking. So as we can see that as soon as the loop finishes, then the new recording gets added to a new take lane. This will enable us later to comp the preferred take and pick the best part of each of these recordings. Justice. Oh. You remember me. Let's finish up this last take. And it is finished. Some singers actually feel um, comfortable recording their verse first and then their chorus because if they keep singing through the song at once and the chorus is a bit intense, it can exhaust their voice too early. So it's quite common practice that first the verse gets recorded with multiple takes and then the chorus and other bits and then pick the best bits of each. So it's a safety net as well and also um, you feel that you have loads of choices and options and it's easier to please the artist as well because if they don't like one phrase then it can always be swapped out. I had this video but I also have the take so I can show you quickly how to use comping in live um, because it hasn't been there for a very long time but it is a very nice and pleasant um, audition. So, all the takes are here on different take lanes. They're all the same color, all the same name. So what we can do, you can already do this while you're recording, is kind of color code the takes. Um, maybe you can use this traffic light coloring that if you feel like one of them is mm, a bit peachy, you don't need to say anything, just maybe color it red. And then the one that's a bit better, orange, and then the good ones, green. It's just that indication for which takes have what kind of quality. So I'm just gonna kind of demo it. So we're gonna make this first one here red. We can also rename that take to, I'm just gonna call that, that was a bit pitchy. And then the next one, um, I shall make that orange and that can be green and then we leave that um, pink. And then what we can do, so this is one of the ways, there's multiple ways to get this done. There's always like three different ways in life to get one thing done, whichever is more comfortable, is that if we decided that we want to keep, um, however, the first word, let's listen. We got this little um, audition button here um, to listen to that one particular take. So if we are happy with that first I, then all we need to do is select there and then hit enter. And now that moved up there to the main take. And then we can use a different technique. Let's listen to maybe this one um, from that section. So if we like this, then 
We can also move it up to the main take by hitting B, which will bring up the pencil tool, and then we can just select that area. And now that also moved up to the main take. And then, personally, my favorite one is not using the, um, these audition buttons, but to make a selection. Let's maybe comp this last bit. Loop it, select it, and then use the key command of shift command up and down arrow so we can listen and not having to stop between the takes. I'll show you. Shift command down. I settle for the green one. So this is my favorite because I don't need to stop. I just keep on listening the takes one after the other. And then at the end, then we have our main comp at the top. So obviously we can go and clean that up and maybe fade out, but this is how comping works in live. And then, of course, we can um, hide the take lanes because it can take up many, you know, space, especially if it's a long song. So we can just untick show take lanes, um, hide them, we can show them again in case you need to change so it doesn't have to be displayed all the time. So that was about um, comping and the other important thing I wanted to talk about, which is probably the most important one, at least to me, is um, layering doubles, harmonies and odd lips. And there is multiple reasons for them, because um, we can thicken the sound up of the same vocal line, we can create loads of impact and it can really open up the mix because it's for arrangement purposes as well. If we have a verse and then we have a chorus, we, you know, we want that energy to change in the chorus. So having extra layers and extra sounds and extra you know, things happening to the vocals as well can really just add some interesting dimensions and change the energy of the arrangement as well. So I've got a massive project here with loads of vocals. It's an unfinished production, um, but I can show um, what a difference it can make. If I zoom in, so those are their all layers. Let's have a little listen what the song is like. get the idea. So first thing first, the lead vocals. That's just the normal line that we heard. It is spiced up with a little reverse reverb, which like leads in the vocal, which sounds like this. And I think it makes quite a lot of difference in context. So the vocals don't just come in so suddenly. 
basically. Um, and then there are some doubles of the same lines, so it is layered. And the way it was sung, I'm going to solo the main lead for a bit. I want you to be the two I can find. And then the double. You know where I go. I want you to be the two. So I deliberately sung it softer, so it doesn't have the exact same characteristics of the vocal, so it can make a nice layer and thicken it up and also the different effect processing to it to support the lead vocal and just open it up a bit but not too much just yet and then what else do we have here so we have some harmonies the funny bit is going to be that some of these elements if i'm going to solo them they some of them are even going to find sound funny because they don't make so much sense on their own but when they play them together, they all play a vital element. But I don't know if anybody produced like gang vocals before as well, just like loads of shouting and loads of people. Um, the solo can be really funny. So let's see. So there is one harmony here for the left. Yeah, I think I didn't even tune that, but it doesn't matter. And then we got another one. Yeah, I definitely didn't tune that. And then the two of them. So it's already thickening up a bit. And then we also have here another layer for the chorus. Um, da, da. So there's no lead vocal playing. So it is literally just sung again and again with different characteristics, sound characteristics. And there's some extra comes in towards the second bit of the chorus. Let's see. There are also harmonies for the beginning as well. It is a big session. So these are more like going together with the lead vocal. Some words emphasize no where i go i want you to be there too i can find all the time to be around it grows every time when you look into my eyes i could say deep inside because i gotta go so these are like just there at the bottom, maybe we wouldn't have even picked it up if I didn't solo them, but it did, it did make a really big difference. And then also what we can do for like second half of songs is having these like little repeated words, which can always help a little bit because it's an already kind of um, familiar riff or words that can just help the flow. <laughs> like little shouts here and there at the end um, and lastly probably my favorite bit is these harmonies which kind of just ended up like an instrument in a sense so let me just quickly solo those and I'm gonna take off the side chain <laughs> So 
slogan is just made out of me randomly humming four times in different pitches built into the track and then eventually getting a bit of sidechain compression to the kick. <laughs> Again, just layers, odd lips, little ear candies, words, who's, has, reverse words. They cannot so, so much around a lead vocal. And I think this is all what I had time for today. Maybe I can take a couple of questions. I don't know if anybody has, probably not, but if anything burning. Hello, thanks Hello. so much. <laughs> Um, are you panning the vocals differently and how? Yes. So because of the dimension, it's actually a really good question. Because um, when you have this so many harmonies, if you look, this is all the panning for all of them. So they are like all over in the stereo field. Um, so lower octaves, things, you know, that was pitched down, I tend to leave them a bit more centered because obviously we want to keep low frequencies in the center so we don't mud up the mix. And the higher the harmony, the pitch, the more I tend to pan it harsher to the sides. So if it's like a mid harmony, somewhere like this, if it's like a really high, like an octave higher, like this. And then, yeah, the low ones kind of centered, but very, very good question. Yes, because that's the, that's the point of having all these layers, for example, for the chorus, so we can open up the chorus and the mix. So thanks for asking a question. I was just wondering your favorite plugin, if you could recommend one plugin to brighten up the vocals. I don't really have one favorite plugin. I think I have like a group of plugins, which I wanted to get to of what I always use, but some of them is will be one saturation, yes, to spice a little bit up the vocals. I love using multiband compression. So actually, if I needed to um, pick one, then that that would be that would be one. I had a question about um, S's. So yes. like you know when you're yeah. <laughs> so you know when you're recording like so many stacks of vocals, how do you like? approach like DSing? Like are you DSing like individually or are you automating things? So it depends on the S. If it's a very big S and I don't need to DS, then I will maybe try to cut the big S and pull down the gain on the actual clip. So the waveform comes down um, a little bit or automate, but more the clip gain because DSing is compression. So it will affect a little bit the other, you know, the other part of the vocal as well. So if it's just small S's, especially if it's rapping, then yeah, the S thing, because that'd be too many S's, too fast, you know, it's just too much editing. But yeah, also a very good question. Whatever works, basically. I sometimes also get a bit lazy and do some isotope plugins to remove some specific frequencies. So I don't need to edit so much, but yeah, clip gain and... Um, Thank you. And the yes thing. Really helpful. Thank you very much for coming. I hope it was useful.